Well, I've got 316 and I do want to be very respectful of your time. Um, and I do want to thank Ben Horgan here is going to keep letting some folks in as we get things started. Uh, we have had, uh, we were talking earlier, probably about 30 other people who said they weren't able to make it, but do want to see the recording to this. So I know the topic uh, between your attendance here plus the, the 30 plus we know who will be watching it later. Um, we're excited to have you uh, be able to participate in this webinar. Let me just take a moment before we pop some slides up uh, to get us started with prayer and to kind of frame the prayer today. You know, I found two quotes from um, Pope Francis that I thought were just particularly fitting uh, for this conversation we're about to embark upon. So the first quote uh, Pope Francis had, had shared was, I am aware of the contributions that the Hispanic community offers to the life of the nation. I ask you to consider how your local church ministries can better respond to the growing presence, gifts, and potential of Hispanic young people and families and of other cultures. And the second quote uh, from a different writing from the Pope was, the greatest failure that an educator can have is to educate within the walls, walls of a selective culture, the walls of a culture of security the walls of a social category that is affluent and no longer goes forward. And so with those two quotes in mind, we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. O Holy Spirit, give to us the vision to see injustice in this world, the love to care about our neighbors, the poor and the marginalized, the wisdom to know how we can help and the courage to act and do whatever we can. Help us to participate more fully in the work of Jesus Christ and every part of our global community. For this we pray, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Well, again, I appreciate everybody's attendance uh, on the call today, and we will send out uh, the recording afterwards for those of you that do uh, chime in and uh, click on the link here uh, in a few weeks. But I do want to, yep, thank you, Manny. I was going to say we'll pop up some slides, uh, put that into, into uh, our presentation mode. So within the Partners in Mission booklet uh, that you all ideally have received at this point in the school year already, uh, there are a series of calls of what it means to be a Zavarian Brother sponsored school. And I've put two of those calls up on the screen here to, to get us started. And you can read those for yourself. And again, hopefully it's not the first time you're seeing those, but these two particular calls of what it means to be a Zavarian Brother sponsored school, I think speak very much to the conversation that we're about to embark upon. I'll readily admit that we, when we talk about enrollment of Hispanic and Latino families, yes, there, there is an enrollment component. All of our schools wanna have strong enrollment, but this conversation is just as much, if not more a mission conversation as it is an enrollment conversation. And these two bullets are speaking specifically to that mission and what we are striving to do within our school communities. We'll jump ahead to the next one. Manny, you know, I wanted to take three minutes before I introduce Manny just to, to share my own background in this. Um, some of you are probably, I haven't met on this call, you know, prior to jumping into this role in the sponsorship office for the brothers, I was the superintendent of schools in the Archdiocese of Omaha. And I had spent about 20 years out in Omaha. Um, you know, I think many of the schools in Omaha, before we started to teach ourselves on how to improve our relationship and our outreach to the Hispanic community, we all kind of thought the same way. We thought that if we simply translated our marketing material into Spanish, we were doing a good job with Hispanic outreach. And we all kind of felt proud about it that, you know, hey, we translated it, you know, pat ourselves on the back and felt like we were being inclusive to the, to the Hispanic community. And I eventually in my travels met a Father Joe Capora from Notre Dame, who I know is a close colleague to, to Manny, that I'm about to introduce. And Father Joe kind of put me in my place real fast and said, you poor, poor boy, you know, you, you think you're reaching out to the Hispanic community, but you could not be having a bigger swing and a miss. Um, and when I spent time and actually learned what Notre Dame was, was doing and was advocating for in terms of Catholic schools and outreach to the Hispanic communities, my eyes were open. And so what you can see here, in 1415 is when we started kicking off across the 70 schools in the archdiocese, a new way of approaching outreach to the Hispanic and Latino communities. And you can see the numbers. We added over the course of what, five or six years, nearly a thousand new students, Hispanic students into the system. 
first and only dip was this year. Uh, and I got these numbers sent to me because it's been a few years since I've been out there. But uh, because of COVID, some of those numbers dialed back a little bit. But I do suspect over time, these numbers will continue to increase. So we'll jump ahead one more, Manny. And I don't want to steal a lot of, of Manny's um, presentation, but when I talked about, you know, in the archdiocese and even my own approach, originally it was, hey, let's translate this, we're reaching out. And if I could really summarize down the biggest core attribute of what needs to change, it is, you know, building what we talk about in our Zavarian charism and spirituality, those enduring personal relationships. And the Notre Dame folks and Father Kapoor you know, told us, you need to get out of your building and go into the community and establish those relationships and let them know that when you do translate your marketing materials, you're specifically speaking to them, but it needs to come with that personal invitation. So in the Archdiocese, we did everything that we could. We joined the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that existed in Omaha. We went to the Cinco de Mayo parades. Any cultural event that was being put on by the Hispanic community, we made sure somebody was present. In the bottom left, you'll see a picture of the St. Thomas More one, the, the guy in the white shirt, that was me. You know, I'd go down and walk 24th Street in Omaha. Anytime there was a big, event in the Hispanic community, 24th Street was the street to be on. And so I'd spend a significant amount of time there meeting with the business owners and the restaurants, letting them know that Catholic schools are here for their community. And once those relationships were established, it really helped blossom uh, the marketing pitch. And the woman in the orange shirt that you see in a couple photos, uh, Manny's going to talk a little bit about a Madrinas program. We adopted that wholeheartedly. And Beatrice Arlanas, who's there in the orange, I will say is probably one of the strongest Madrinas in the country. And that was a, somebody that we brought on to help us kind of break into that Hispanic market, somebody that the community would trust right out of the gate. And uh, Manny's going to talk a great deal about the importance of the Madrinas. But I'll just say, from my experiencing, experience, everything that you're about to hear, we followed it to a T and ended up again having close to a thousand new students come into our Catholic schools. So again, very much a, a strengthening the mission of the Catholic schools as much as it did some of those enrollment patterns. So with that, I don't want to steal a lot of what Manny's going to talk about because I know it'll hit more on some of these uh, pieces, but uh, Manny Fernandez is the program director of the Latino Enrollment Institute at Notre Dame. Following a long career as an elementary, middle school, and high school teacher in Los Angeles and Goshen, Indiana, Manny joined the ACE team to help facilitate the improvement and expansion of Catholic education within the Latino population. Each year, he taught in Indiana. He was recognized by the State Department of Education for facilitating the highest growth in test scores among his students. He resides in South Bend with his wife, his daughter, and his two sons. Manny's a graduate from the California State University at Los Angeles with a degree in urban learning, a teaching program designed specifically for working with at-risk children from poverty-stricken neighborhoods. So Manny, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And again, Manny, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Patrick. It's great to be here and great to meet you all. I have not been in the office in a year. And now that my computer is on the system, it says they're running an upgrade. So if, I, uh, if my computer shuts down, uh, I'll be back in a few minutes uh, once this upgrade is done. I can't. Of course, this is happening now. Uh, but anyways, um, so that's what'll happen. I'll be right back on if it does uh, shut down. Um, but anyways, great to meet you all. I uh, like you said, I've been. Uh, I work for the LA, uh, the Latino Enrollment Institute at the University of Notre Dame, um, and I've been here for over nine years, working with Catholic schools all over the country to help them recruit and serve Latino children, um, their families, and their children. The tools I'll give you are research-based and anecdotally, we know they work um, and we have the numbers uh, to prove it. We've seen some amazing accomplishments in the schools we've worked with. Now, I haven't been um, a high school uh, teacher or I worked at a high school for over uh, 10 years. So I've invited Jo Jones. Um, she's gonna be able to uh, help me answer some questions you may have at the end of the session. Um, she originally was a principal in Holland, Michigan and did an amazing job of growing her own school's uh, Latino enrollment there before recently moving to Maryland to become the executive director of academics at Notre Dame Prep in Towson, Maryland. She also serves on the boards of several schools and corporations. So her wisdom is requested by many and I'm happy she, she can make it. Now, before we, we begin, let's see if it's even letting me, oh my, oh, there we go. Uh, let's talk about uh, some numbers um, that were recently released by the NCEA. Um, enrollment in Catholic schools in the U.S. dropped 6.4% from the previous academic year, 
um, a lot of it due to these uh, pe the pandemic and academic stresses. And nationwide, it's dropped by 110,000. Um, now, back uh, in the 60s, it was 5 million. So we're down to you know 1.6 million students. That's, that's a big drop. Um, and the, with the recent wave of closures, there are now uh, just under 6,000 Catholic schools in the United States compared with more than 11,000 in 1970. And elementary uh, and middle schools were hit harder with a collective enrollment decline of 8.1% compared to only 2.5% decline for secondary schools. Now in the short term, that's not such bad news for you all. But eventually those formerly Catholic school kids now attending public schools will be high schoolers. And we all know that it's far easier to recruit students from Catholic schools than public schools. So all these numbers matter. Now let's look at the Latino population. Out of 8 million uh, school-aged Latino Catholics, only 318,000 are enrolled in Catholic schools. Um, and Latinos are among the most devout Catholics you're going to find. So they are clearly going to be a large and important part of the future of the Catholic uh, Church in the United States. <clears throat> and yet our schools, the Catholic schools, the number one ev evangelizers of the Catholic faith in our country, are largely failing to adequately serve this population. So while many Catholic schools aren't just, just aren't doing the work, uh, ah, what, what many Catholic schools are doing just isn't working and we have to change or we'll become irrelevant and replaced by free charter schools or private schools for the elite. And so one way to combat this is to recruit more Latino children. Let's see if I can get this down, oh, there we go, uh, to our schools. Now there are major reasons why Uh, we believe that schools should be doing this, uh, diversity being a strength included. But the number one reason can be found when you just look at the raw numbers. The average age of Latinos in the United States is, is just 27 years old. For comparison, the average age of their non-white Hispanic counterparts is 42. Now, due to their young age, Hispanics are driving the majority of population growth in the country, even though they just make up, they make up just 18% of the population. And I'll go a little further, 42% of Catholics in the United States right now are Latino. The younger you go, the more Latino it gets. Latino Catholics under the age of 18 make up 63% of the Catholic church in the United States. Latinos are extremely devout Catholics on the whole. But on the other hand, as much growth as we've seen with Latino Catholics, they are the largest group leaving the church. And as I said earlier, Catholic schools are the number one evangeliz evangelizers of the faith, and yet we aren't serving enough Latino students. To, to keep them Catholic. So as our country becomes more secular while also becoming more multicultural, and as models show the growth of the uh, Latino population is only gonna continue to rise in these next few de decades, the Catholic church and as an extension, Catholic schools are gonna rely on the Latino population to survive and thrive. So if Latino Catholics aren't in your area already, they will be and we will need, to serve to, uh, to, uh, we'll need them to sustain and grow the Catholic church. So this talk is about how to increase Latino enrollment in our Catholic schools through marketing strategies and techniques aimed at the Latino community in your area. Now to illustrate my point, I want to uh, look at uh, just how three families helped transform the enrollment at St. James the Less in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we start with the Rodriguez family. They had four kids at the school and they uh, talked to their cousins and their aunts and their uncles and they got four more, and then five more, and then five more, and then more and more, where they ended up with 26 Rodriguez's at St. James the Less. Then they had the Garcia family, who they were uh, neighbors with. The Garcias added students, and then they added more families, and more families, and more families. There was 19 Garcia kids, and the Garcias knew the Sanchez family, and the Sanchez family added two kids, and then five kids, and then more and more kids. And there was 18 Sanchez uh, family kids. So all combined, that's 63 students in one school from only three families. And you'll see how that happens as we go through this uh, presentation. So let's begin. This presentation will, be, uh, will give you nine strategies um, that you can begin tomorrow to help grow your school's profile in the Latino community and grow your uh, enrollment as a result. So number one, um, Patrick already ta uh, talked about this and he tells me you should be very familiar with this phrase, which is great. We want to build authentic relationships, personal relationships. Now, when I started giving talks to teachers over 15 years ago about, about the Latino population and how to reach Latino students and their families, there wasn't a lot of talk about building relationships with students. Um, but now you hear it everywhere, which is fantastic and, and shows you we've, we've come a long way. So if you take anything away from today's talk, 
It should be that you need to build authentic relationships with your Latino families. This is paramount above all else. And that is because it is so vital in the Latino community. So I cannot stress this importance uh, of this enough. So who do you contact? Um, because of all this, you wanna do as much in-person communication as possible. And you wanna build as many strong relationships as possible. But with who? Well, first off, your current families. Become a student of their cultures. Build a school where relationships clearly matter to you and your staff. You'll see that retention of current families by building a quality school comes before everything else. And then these parents will be your best ambassadors for recruiting other parents, which we'll get to uh, more into, into strategy number two when we talk about madrinas. But if you can build quality relationships with current Latino families, this could pay off tenfold in bringing more Latino families to your school. So direct person-to-person um, -person contact is best when communicating with Latino families. In a study of high-performing uh, Hispanic schools near the border in Texas, some strategies used by the school staff to make personal contact with parents included creating opportunities for positive interaction on a, on a regular basis, engaging in small talk with parents, calling parents by phone, and making home visits. Now, obviously, with COVID, making home visits you know, is, is not um, acceptable right now, but eventually it will be. And we want to do this because we want to build these personal relationships with their, um, with the students and with the families. Now, in larger school, this larger schools, this isn't such an easy task, but that's where delegation and organization is essential. We do it for students when we see they're about to fail. So why don't we do it, you know, all the time? Um, because we are, we are, we obviously know how to do it. Being proactive uh, about um, about being there for the families helps students and families. And in turn, the schools, it helps them in so many ways. So we wanna be proactive in building these relationships. If you're contacting them via email or anything written, be sure to assess um, the specific, uh, the reading level for the specific community you are targeting. So it's essential that your materials are reading level appropriate. It's not just enough to uh, translate them. You want to make it at the, at the appropriate reading level. So for immigrant parents, who do not have a mastery of English, they might even have a mastery of Spanish. Um, but written communication must be clear um, and accessible, short sentences, simple vocabulary, Spanish or English, written materials must be easily understood by the intended audience. And when I say they don't have a command of Spanish, they, they have a command of, of you know, um, they don't have a command of academic Spanish per se or necessarily. So we wanna make sure that they can um, access and read everything that you're sending. Now for context, the average reading level in the United States for native speakers is eighth grade. So I, we work with a lot of high schools that there sometimes their language is kind of above the level of, of, the, of the community they're, they're, um, they're serving. So we wanna make sure we're okay with that. All right, so that's number one, we wanna build relationships. Number two is develop a team of madrinas or some people call them Latino outreach coordinators. Um, we call them uh, madrinas. Now, it could be men as well. We call those padrinos. But for the sake of argument, uh, let's call them madrinas. It means godmother in Spanish. But they go by different names throughout the country, depending on the school. We've heard Latino parent ambassadors, Latino outreach coordinators. Uh, we even work with a school that has a group that goes by Latina, Latina mamas. Um, we'll call them madrinas for today. But the best part about this program is that it's completely free, which we all love. It's also highly effective and it doesn't cost you a ton of time either in relationship to how much a broader um, marketing campaign would cost you, um, you know, uh, as far as time, effort and money. So Hispanics are a collectivist culture, placing strong value on the needs of the community as a whole and maintaining close contacts with each other. A quality madrina could be your number one recruiter and marketer for your school. So having at least one of these parents on your side um, recruiting for your school can be invaluable to your efforts to drive enrollment. So let's talk about the roles and char uh, characteristics of a madrina. So madrinas, they can be your marketer. They, madrinas act as bridges or the links that connect families from the parish and the surrounding communities to the school. They're very trusted. So um, like uh, Patrick said with Beatriz um, Arianes, she knows everybody in the community and they all trust her. So when she says it, it's like, you know, P.F. Hutton, everybody's listening. So we want to make sure um, you have someone, your madrina is someone that's respected and listened to in the community. They're also uh, active recruiters for you. They facilitate the process of introduction 
uh, to the school of interest and enrollment. And finally, they're also mentors. They ensure that the family, especially the student, is acclimating success successfully into the school environment. So they, they have three distinct roles, um, but most madrinas do all of it in one. Let's quickly talk about the characteristics of a madrina. If you um, are thinking about somebody that could possibly be a madrina or a padrino for your school, first of all, they have school children in the school or grandchildren in the school, um, or they have sent children um, uh, to your school. They're highly engaged and active in the parish and or the school community. Uh, number three, uh, they demonstrate a broad network base and is well connected to families throughout the parish and surrounding uh, communities. They have a deep love for the school and parish and want to see the school uh, flourish. And not only that, they want to see um, the, their fellow Latinos um, in the community, they want to see them flourish. And they know that an education, a quality education, is a way out in the United States, um, a way out of the ghetto or the barrio where they're living. Um, and so they cherish a quality uh, education. And of course they cherish um, their children or their grandchildren sharing, the, sharing in the Catholic faith with them. And finally, you would prefer them to be Spanish speaking bilingual. Um, that's not a, a, necess a necessity in places like Boston or Los Angeles that have maybe second or third uh, generation um, families there. But um, if you're dealing with immigrant families, you want them to be, um, uh, bilingual. So I urge you um, all to to really uh, seriously think about uh, having a madrina or a you know a, a Latino outreach coordinator and how they can be used to help grow and sustain uh, your enrollment. Number three, engage parish families about the advantages of a Catholic education. Now I know in your situations you are not necessarily connected to parishes in the way that elementary schools are. But you would be remiss if you are not actively recruiting at your local parishes, as you are going to find a much more willing audience, a much more engaged audience at a Catholic church than almost anywhere else, especially Spanish language masses where the pews often tend to be fuller uh, than other masses. And while we talk about the, we'll talk about the middle schools later. When you go to the middle schools, you reach the kids and the staff, and at times you reach the parents. But when you go to mass, you reach the parents and the extended family. And extended family is huge uh, for Latinos. So let's go over some quick strategies. Number one, speak from the ambo at a Spanish speaking mass. If you can uh, talk to the priest and, and let them go up and talk to you like during you know, uh, different times of the year, um, that would be great. And Spanish speaking is not a must. Speaking in broken Spanish is absolutely okay. If you can give a, uh, say a quick introduction in Spanish, talking about how much you love the school, uh, how much you love seeing your students prepare for the world and want them to get a faith-filled education, just a couple sentences, that's all they need to see. For that brief moment, they will know that you know how it feels for them every single day about not being able to speak the language perfectly. And then you can have a parent after that take over or a teacher, um, you know, speak more about the school from there. Don't just go once, be consistent. Go back during the week of the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example, or, or Catholic Schools Week. Go every time you have a major event. Let them know that your school is accessible, affordable, and attainable for their children. Uh, unfortunately, many Spanish speaking or immigrant families don't think that uh, Catholic schools are attainable for their children simply because in uh, Mexico or Costa Rica or, or you know um, anywhere in Latin America, Catholic schools are for the uber wealthy, for the elite. Um, it's not for the working class. And so when they get to America, they just don't think that it's even uh, possible. And we have schools in school choice states like Indiana, Florida, that are still empty. Um, it's not about the finances because they're, they, can get, um, they can get these kids in for free. Um, it's about they don't even know that the school is attainable for them. So we, uh, and they don't build relationships with them. So we wanna to make sure that, that um, families know that. Let's go to number four. We need to start thinking outside the box. There are several ways to market to the community. You just have to think outside of the normal ways that we've been doing it. Now it's an often used uh, cliche nowadays, uh, but it rings true that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. In the case of marketing, we've seen schools keep their same outdated marketing strategies that worked in 2005, but they don't work anymore, but they keep doing it. Flyers, 
um, things that you hang on the doors or whatever, those don't work, um, especially um, in the case of marketing to the Latino population. Those definitely don't work. They're using the same strategies for Caucasian families uh, as they do Latinos. And then they wonder, why isn't it working? So you have to think outside the box, or as I heard in, in a tech talk just last night, um, shift your watering holes. You know, what that means is we have to look to engage and interact and embrace the Latino community in a variety of different ways. And there are opportunities uh, to recruit everywhere you look. It just takes the right mindset, a committed team, and a persistent work ethic. So where can you go? Well, let's start with your parents. Um, not every Latino is poor. Are there businesses, uh, are there business owners among your parents' um, uh, clientele at your school? Can you drop off promotional material there? What many of our schools in the past have done is, you know, pre-COVID, attend any events in the large Latino areas or events that are for Latinos. For example, let's say uh, your town hosts a Dia de los Muertos event. You can make sure that you host a booth there. We've, we've seen schools have their representatives dress up as uh, dress up and speak to the community at these types of events where admission counselors and other admi uh, administrators speak in Spanish if possible to all the people that they can. They, uh, the, you have Spanish health fairs. Uh, here you'll see one in, in uh, Lenox, California, which is a, you know, a rural community. It's not you know, a bustling place in, in like Los Angeles or something. You have here in Henderson, Nevada, again, another smaller city. Um, but they have Latino festivals um, where you can set up a booth, like we said. You have, besides those, the big places, you can set up your own um, you know, festivals. Um, you know, we have one school that, that's here in, uh, that, that you see here. Uh, it's called Once de Mayo, but every around you know Cinco de Mayo, which is May fifth, a big celebration, they'll have a huge celebration for the whole community. With it's got a Spanish uh, theme, but you have like everybody in the community, and they get to see their school. Um, we also have like like even in rural and non-traditional Latino areas, there are Latino festivals. Like we said, the Latino population is growing so much that there's Latinos everywhere. And Latinos love to party. And so they're going to find a place to have celebrations, you know, once, once, of course, this COVID is over. So think about other places like restaurants. Um, you know, you, if you have a Mexican restaurant, even if it's been like Americanized and it's not necessarily authentic uh, Mexican food, you're going to have Mexican cooks or Puerto Rican cooks or Dominican cooks. And th they, they have children. And so we have to start thinking about, okay, how can we recruit um, from those areas? Or, you know, shops like, um, you know, Garden City is, which are, are butcher, butcher shops, small markets, um, you know, small grocery stores. Those are all places that we need to start thinking about where we can recruit. Open houses. You can have, you know, when you have open houses in high school, you can have, just even if it's for five parents, have a Spanish speaking uh, child present. That is powerful because they can see one of your students speaking Spanish to these children and and they see their children in that child. Now, Latinos, especially young Latinos, use social media a lot. Now, how can we leverage that? Um, there's no bigger demographic group in the United States that consumes media like the Hispanic population. Surveys and studies show that Latinos use social media platforms more than any, of their, any other cohorts, including Caucasians. So let's look at some numbers. In 2015, roughly 77% of US Hispanic internet users access social, uh, social networks compared to 69% of the overall US. In, on Facebook, by far the most widely used social media site, 73% of all Hispanic adult internet users have a presence compared to 71% of the total internet user population. Instagram, the gap is gonna be even higher. 21% of the Caucasian adult internet users um, use Instagram while 34% of all Latinos uh, maintain a presence on that site. And a quarter of Latinos use Twitter compared to 21% of Caucasians. So we need to leverage that by beefing up our online presence, if you haven't already. Some high schools are at the forefront of this. Um, they document a ton and put it up online. Everything from kids sharing their testimonials or when a student commits to attend to your high school, to sporting events, to of course, kids getting accepted into college. Uh, you can even uh, spotlight successful alumnus if you're not doing that already. And if you have a successful Latino alumnus, uh, even better. 
So with everyone stuck at home right now, many schools have relied heavily on social media and it's proven effective. We have one affluent school we work with in Georgia that went all in on their social media presence in light of COVID. And they have uh, their first ever waiting list um, in their freshman class, which they attribute to going all in on social media and finding more Latinos than they've ever had. Of course, all of this takes a lot of effort. Um, translating documents, going to a Spanish mass, um, you know, but it's deeper than that. Let's uh, take, for example, corporations that captured the Latino uh, market early and made a smart, concerted effort to market to that audience. And they ended up making a ton of money. Uh, McDonald's, Walmart, AT&T, um, those are some of the companies that have been extremely successful in marketing their products to Hispanics in the United States because they made it a priority and didn't merely ask, stick to their, their stick their toe into the pool, so to speak. They did the research and then they went all in and it worked. And as of course, as we keep stating, building a relationship with Hispanic consumers has allowed these companies to maintain strong uh, ties to the Latino community for decades and their profits keep growing. Now let's look at, uh, let's contrast that to the California Milk Processors Board. They had those commercials and ads where they made the Got Milk slogan a household name. And they were really funny. Um, they were timely, they were memorable, they were great. So they wanted to tap into the, lang the Spanish language market. And they did a simple English to translate, uh, to Spanish translation of Got Milk. And their Spanish translation of, of it was, are you lactating? So aside from being straight up, you know, offensive in the literal sense of the wording the, uh, that they used, Latina mothers didn't get the joke that the American audience loved. To them, it was insulting to think that they wouldn't have milk on hand for their children. Of course, they have milk for their children. They take their roles of mothers as mothers seriously, and a Latina mother would never let their kids down when it comes to food and drink. That was their um, way of taking it in. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but the slogan didn't resonate with them. It was just a different culture. The advertisers changed course. They actually did some research, and they came up with the slogan, Familia, Amor y Leche, which is family, love, and milk. And it, it did way better and it took off. So when thinking about your uh, marketing campaign, do not un underestimate the importance of Spanish language, of course, but way more importantly, Spanish culture. Uh, according to a recent study on social media and consumer behavior trends, Latinos choose content that is trusted and speaks to them culturally first, regardless of language. What is meaningful to one culture might not be meaningful to another. And Latino consumers really key in on culture when choosing a product. And when choosing a school, they will look at what you are selling and if it resonates with them. One key understanding, half of second generation Hispanics are bilingual, while only 23% of third generation are. So there are themes that resonate when developing a marketing strategy for, strategy for Hispanics with language and cultural considerations woven throughout, but really key on culture. Um, as you're doing those, as you're doing a marketing campaign. Now, those are the uh, the top four strategies, and we spent a little bit more time on them. Uh, these next fo uh, five points are important as well. We won't go as far in depth um, in the interest of time. Um, so let's start with number five: ABC. Always be closing. In general, Latino families just do not join a school the first time they inquire about it. It's a such a big investment for them. And they might be skittish about joining for a variety of reasons. Now, if you have a poorer family, $15,000 a year is a lot different to a wealthy family, $15,000 a year. So they really um, feel this is such a big investment. They're not just going to jump right in. So you have to put time into building the relationships with those families. It could turn out to be a lot of work on the front end that you're just not used to. In general, Families, Latino families do not join, just join a school the first time they inquire about it. Like we said, you might have to call. You have, have to continue to call. Having a bilingual parent there would be uh, hugely beneficial, especially when they can uh, help ease any fears or concerns like the madrina or just a, a staff member. You saw the enrollment numbers earlier and how they are dropping. So we have to convince parents why spending 15000 or 20000 or 25000 a year at your school is better than going to the local public school for free or even worse, the local charter school, as many parents hear the word charter and they automatically think good. Um, and so we're fighting that battle. So if you go to a mass afterwards, you have to be available to answer questions and be prepared with bilingual materials and English masses as well. Never let prospective parents leave without getting their contact informa information. Be persistent. 
it may take a lot of work up front um, that, that, like I said, you might not be into, uh, might, might not be used to. But once you get them in, they cause far less headaches, far less work for you because they are so reverent to a Catholic education that that front end that you're putting in is so much worth it because you get four years of parents that are just happy that their children get to have a Catholic education. Um, let's go to number six, uh, middle school. Yeah. Um, once they, uh, this is a no brainer for you guys because I know all of you work, ex work extensively with your local Catholic elementary schools, but specifically with Latinos, what can be done? Um, because what we've seen is that schools, um, that they give the same pitch to every parent. And that's not just the best way to go about this. A good salesperson varies his or hers or pitch depending on the potential client. And we want schools to do the same thing. So for an affluent family with a long line of college educated family members, if you tell them that 90% of your students graduate and go to college, it's not such a great selling point because they already know their kids are going to college. It's baked in the cake. As you already know, you'll need to tell them the quality of universities your, your students are attending, for example. But telling an immigrant family or a family without means that their child will not only graduate high school, but, but that you will do everything in, their, in your power to make sure he or she attends college, that's a powerful, persuasive statement. Now, assuming you're working with immigrant families or families with blue collar uh, breadwinners, many of those families automatically think they can't afford higher tuition for high school and assume they need to go to public schools. So one vital strategy we encourage is to offer joint presentations, Spanish materials included, facilitated by the finance offices of both the middle school and the high school. You need to ensure that those families receiving financial assistance in middle school, that you can also help them afford high school. You can help ease that transition from middle school to high school and even offer them help to do the paper, help doing the paperwork. Again, it's a word of mouth thing. If you can get one influential Latino parent to say to a hesitant parent, no, they will work with you, that makes all the difference. And, and we go about it. Now, I know this isn't for every, it, it isn't possible, but we really try to make sure that finances aren't, um, aren't uh, uh, stopping students from, become, from getting the gift of a Catholic education. If at all possible, we don't want finances uh, to be the case. Now that's, you know, that's a perfect world, but if we can make it work, we wanna make it work. You also have to have a good relationship with uh, the middle school's principal and, and, and they know if, if, uh, that your high school offers intervention, they need to, to be able to say that uh, to the middle school parents especially for language and other uh, accommodations. That's a huge benefit. One school we worked with even had, uh, even sent their counselor periodically to our high school to check in on their students. Uh, another idea we received from one of our mentor principals that we like to share, and it's not just for Latino students, uh, was this school offered a middle school leadership conference at the high school once a year. A lot of the students who attended were Latino and it gave them an opportunity to see how they could fit in to the high school environment along with everyone else. And uh, that's, that idea has spread and a lot of schools are starting to do that. All right, number seven, to recruit successfully, you need to know the differences in your family's regions cult, uh, and countries of origin. So we need to become students of our, our, students, uh, of our students' cultures, our family's cultures. Your school will most likely reflect the community that surrounds it. So what groups represent your school? And then you need to get to know these groups and cater your marketing strategies around them. So if you go to census.org, you can find some of that info if you don't know it already. Here's an example of what you'll see and how each demographic is broken down. Now, in this case, you see a, a town in Massachusetts that has over 5,000 Latinos. We used to be able to break down, see that breakdown of every Latino graphic. Uh, you can't see it because of my, my screen here, let's see. Uh, you'll see where it says other. Um, and right there, it says 3,708. That's like 80% of the, of the Latinos. For some reason, the last administration um, decided to put other for everything other than Cuban, Mexican, and Puerto Rican. So I wasn't uh, able to find out what other stands for with this town, but my guess is that it would be Dominicans. But I did quickly look up Lowell, which one of your schools is uh, here, uh, is in Lowell, and they have a large Puerto Rican population. And then Malden, Massachusetts, it's half Mexican, half Puerto Rican. So when you're dealing with people from different countries within the Latino population, one size fits all doesn't work. 
so for example, you can't have, oh, you can't have pan dulce um, when you are, uh, you know, when you're doing a, um, you know, a meeting for a parents, uh, when the majority of your parents are Dominican, but Dominicans like things like uh, dulce de leche or flan. Um, Puerto Rican, uh, our, you know, the Lady of Guadalupe for, is, Mex you know, our, our um, the Virgin Mary um, for Mexicans is, we, we call her Our Lady of Guadalupe. But for Puerto Ricans, it's Our Lady of Divine Providence, Nuestra Señora de la Divina Providencia. For Dominicans, it's Our Lady of Mercy, Nuestra, Nuestra Señora de la Mercedes. Now, as Father Joe likes to say, it's the same gal, just you know, dressed differently. Um, but we want to make sure we honor their their culture. Um, and you'll see behind me, you'll see uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, but you know, we want to uh, like honor every culture. So make sure you know uh, your students and your family's cultures. Number eight: um, extend personal invitations to prospects and their parents. Uh, prospective students and their parents. This goes back to what we were talking about with strategy one in building authentic personal relationships. Um, you don't want to, um, I mean, you, you want to know that blanket invitations in open houses most likely won't work as effectively as personal invitations. So as much as possible, make the invitations personal. A phone call, a phone call to a Latino parent uh, or a message in WhatsApp goes a lot further than a flyer. Be prepared when you do extend invitations to welcome the extended family. Uh, you know, we work with, uh, with a lot of families that will bring their uncle in, their grandma, their grandma. So if you have a meeting with them and you just have two chairs for the mom and dad, um, that's not going to work for a lot of these families. If, if grandma and grandpa live with them, that's like their family. It's a different culture. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying the Latino families their definition of the nuclear family is a lot more extensive than your typical American family. So we wanna make sure that we honor that by having extra chairs out. They're also gonna bring their little brother and sister. Um, so we always uh, you know, um, you know, encourage people to have uh, you know, books for younger kids um, so that they're entertained during this meeting. If you have a family that's, uh, that works in a, you know, a nine to five job or a, a seven to three job, uh, they can't, they can't just have a babysitter come over. Um, they, they might not just have the money. Um, and so they're gonna bring their children with them or they just, they just believe that, you know, that's part of the family and you know, you get one, you get us all. Um, so they're, they're gonna bring, you know, a uh, bigger family. So make sure you uh, are ready for that. If it's an open house, be prepared to provide hospitality with, hospitality with culturally responsive food and uh, refreshments and welcome the extended family. And when possible, someone in administration should be on all personal tours. Um, if a family suddenly drops in your school to inquire about the school, if at all possible, immediately drop what you're doing and lead them on a tour. Now, in the sense of a high school, that uh, maybe it should be someone in admissions, uh, the principal, the president, anybody that can be in a position of um, authority at the school, uh, they should be on that personal tour. They should be priority, these families should be priority number one. When you have the chance to give the gift of a, of a Catholic education to another child or children, we got to jump on that chance. All right, last one, number, number nine, re-examine your registration process. Is it conducive to Latino parents? It goes without saying that this woman cannot be the first face someone sees when they walk into your school, but especially for families who might struggle with the English language. They're going to walk in, see her with a dour face, and walk right out. I'd be scared of her, and I know the English language, and I'd be scared, and I wouldn't want to, um, you know, like talk to her. So, you know, is your um, is your uh, setup conducive to Latino parents? You might have registration forms in Spanish, which is great, but just because the registration forms are in Spanish, it doesn't mean that the parents will automatically be able to fill one out. Um, I can tell you, like uh, my daughter, when you know when she signed up for preschool. Um, I had to sign her up and the, the, the form, we're a great school, but the forms were so intense. Like there was just so much on it. And, you know, I have a, a master's degree. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I should be able to figure this out, but it was so extensive. I was nervous filling it out. And I was like biting my fingernails when I had to uh, turn it into the, to the secretary and the secretary or the administrative assistants, I'm sorry, she looked at it and she was 
she looked at it and she was shocked that I, that I, that I filled it out. Right. I was shocked that I filled it out. Right. We both did a little happy dance. And what did that tell us? That tells us that is way too hard. That, did, that, that, that this, if, if, if a native speaker has a hard time with it, you know, what are we doing to our, to our families that are, that maybe not, not, not just Latino families, but, but our working family, working class families that maybe, you know, didn't, get past their GED or something like that. We want to be inclusive to everyone. And so, you know, I, I work with our own school, my daughter's school, to make this a much uh, easier process. What do you need to know when they register? And what can you take out and get maybe later? Um, so let's take it from there. Is your setup conducive? Do you have someone to help guide them through the process? Do you have ample space and chairs in case kids and or the extended family show up? And does your administrative assistant or whoever's at the front desk provide a welcoming face. Just think of, I mean, like I, I just did a school tour for a family of my daughter's school. It was a Latino family. It was a two hour tour. Um, felt like Gilligan's Island, it was a two hour tour. Um, it was just, it was, it was long, but it was totally worth it. They just had a lot of questions. They, they just, they're, they've never been in Catholic education, but we signed up four children there. So for that two hours of work, you get four children at the school, and if you want to look at it as a business, which it isn't, it's a mission, but if you want to look at it the business side, we just got, you know, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 if we keep them at that school for two hours of work. So that's what we're, you know, what we want to, um, you know, we want to do, we want to make this a conducive setup. You know what, Patrick, I didn't put uh, what I said I would. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right, quite all right. But maybe yeah, just because I know we're closing in on an hour here. Do you want to maybe introduce Joe and um, invite her to have a few comments, and then we'll do a little Q and A. Yeah, Joe. Do you, um, Joe, from the universe? I mean, from Notre Dame Prep um, out in Towson, Maryland. Do you have any uh, other thoughts you want to share? I do. Um, while I was listening to you, I thought about something that to me has always been compelling, and is another statistic to take with you um, for those of you that are secondary administrators you are taking a child who statistically or a, um, a demographic that statistically might have a 60% graduation rate and you're converting it to the Catholic graduation rate, which last time I checked is pretty much 99.5 nationally. It's extremely high in a Catholic secondary school. So the difference that you're making in everything that comes after is huge and I cannot stress enough what Manny said about um, just embracing the family and the fact that you will be stunned at the respect you will get by that family. Um, in my time in Holland, I uh, my school converted from 10% Latino to probably 50% Latino and the entire culture of that school shifted in such a positive light. It went from a school that was sort of like, what can you do for me to what can I do for you? And um, it was blessed in so many ways. And I really think your Catholic culture and identity, which is very core to your mission, um, will flourish with the addition of these families. So for all you give, you, you, you really get a ton. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Great. So why don't we, um, just again, for the sake of time, if um, we probably got a time for a little bit of questions, if folks want to just throw them out and uh, Manny or Joe would be happy to happy to chime in. Manny and Joe, great, uh, great presentation, very informative. Uh, my name is Jay Conk. I'm the head of school here at Zaverian Brothers High School right outside of Boston. Um, I really appreciated the nine steps there that you had, Manny. And one of the things that I'm curious about is for a school that's maybe starting from scratch or maybe starting with just a little bit um, in this area, about how long does it take to get a program like this, you know, up and running to, you know, where you see it as, hey, this is top notch and this is ready to go. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I would say, I would say it's, it's not going to happen overnight and it's going to take, a, a, you know, several years. Um, I would say the, the number one thing is if you can find that madrina, that Latino outreach coordinator, that will accelerate everything. That, that's gonna tell you your timetable. Um, Joe Jones, um, she had, we bring her madrinas to our conference in, in, in the summer because they're so fantastic. Um, uh, she had two of them that she brings every summer and she speaks to our conference. Um, 
and those type of women are or and, and men if you have a padrino are going to accelerate what you can do you know what you can do but if you don't have that you can still do it it'll just take longer what do you think joe well what i was going to add um uh jake is that the the madrinas that that i would bring down to notre to notre dame eventually their children aged out of the elementaries and ended up in our high schools. And we had um, bridging meetings with the Catholic high schools in Grand Rapids and brought the madrinas to the high school, or actually we brought the principals to our school and sat them down and really talked about what we needed from them in terms of um, a welcoming culture. And ultimately one of my madrinas began to work one to two days a week as a consultant and I, I uh, released her for that because I had, I had others that wanted to come on board and she worked with the faculty because I will tell you what happens that's very unfortunate is a Latino child can walk into your high school and be judged simply by their name and they can be routed into courses and given curriculums. I've heard this over and over and over again that are not challenging. And if they've gone through our Catholic grade schools and you know, I've known Father Joe since before he started LEI. The, there are kids that are, that are ready and willing to go to your Catholic high school. The parents need an assurance that you'll be with them for the four years. And if they've got three other kids and, you know, 12 nieces and nephews, which that exact story happened to me, the one that Manny shared happens over and over again, they really want to know that you'll walk with them. And if you think about it this way, in 15 years, that next iteration, sending kids to the Catholic elementary and then the Catholic high school will not need the same level of support. So you're talking about sustainability of your institutions. I think this is one of the strongest investments you can make is in Latino families, Latino families and, um, and, and the most loyal in terms of, of they, they will send their, their relatives. And Jake, next week we'll talk about culture um, in the school. And Very so much. when you have those 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 two or three Latino families, how can the culture of the school make sure that that you retain them? Yeah. Awesome. Very helpful. Thank you both. Thank you, Jake. Welcome. Anyone else? You know, it, it fits perfectly with global citizenship and inclusivity. Um, if you look around your school and you're not seeing enough of what reflects the world, this is something you should be called to, and it is not an impossible mission. The numbers are in your favor. They truly are. So uh, I'm Rick Spillane. I'm a trustee at uh, Zaverian Brothers High School in Westwood. Jake's our, fortunately, our headmaster, so thank, thank you for that. Jake, um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, one thing you mentioned was news to me about the positioning of a Catholic school to someone who comes from largely uh, from Mexico or Central America, how it's considered to be an elite school and impossible for them. It's just a, such a different concept. Could you go through a little bit more uh, explanation of that one? Yeah, so, um, you know, if, when, when you see someone that'll come to the University of Notre Dame, for example, and they speak perfect English and they're from Mexico, they went to a school that was only for like the ambassador's kids and the uber wealthy kids. The, the kids like down, like, you know, five blocks away aren't going to that school in the, in the Pueblo, they'll call it the, the little town. It's, it's only, so like Monterrey is like the, like one of the wealthiest cities in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, they will, they have like an American school. They call it the American school or something like that. And that's only the really, really wealthy. So the normal, the normal, the, you know, the poor child or the uh, like really middle, like middle-class child is not going to those schools. They're, they're, they're gated. They're, you know, they have machine, they have guys with machine guns outside, you know, protecting the school. Like you are not getting like, because of the kidnappings and everything, you are like not getting into that school if you're not, you know, really wealthy. So um, yeah, that's what they're dealing with. So we've had, you know, principals that, that, like they'll talk to parents and they, the parents will walk by classrooms and go to church and they have no idea that it's a classroom, like that it's a school. They just see the church. And then if they do know it's a school, they're like, we are never going there because it's just been ingrained. They grew up with 
only the you know the the rich and it's usually the the light skinned kids uh the light skinned mexican kids that are going to these you know these wealthy schools it's 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 a sad reality uh joe what do you think um i i, I think it's it's um it's absolutely true that that if a family came from Mexico, if they're an immigrant, that they will not see it as for everybody, which is the opposite of American Catholic education, mm -hmm. which you know for years didn't even charge tuition and was open to everybody and was made for immigrants, ironically, not ironically. Um, so it is, uh, it is just, it's something that you have to overcome. It truly is transformative as they walk through your school and they walk next to you. Um, it, it, you will, you will see what you wish you would see on every tour. You know, you'll see in the faces of those families that they're looking and thinking, wow, this for my child, you know, and, and you have to look at, and I'm sure me and you are going to cover this in future sessions, but you, you really have to reimagine how you support education. You know, you, and many, many, many schools don't have wait lists around the country. And, um, you know, many schools won't be here in 10 or 15 years. You know, I saw, I saw one in Philadelphia, girls' schools closing, uh, it just came through, they were petitioning not to close it, and, and Philadelphia has closed several. Mm -hmm. um, every time I see one close, in my heart and in my head, I think they're so relevant and so needed, mm -hmm. you know? We could fill them many times over if we really, you know, really embrace the mission. Rick, I'd, I'd add on too. I agree everything Manny and Joe said. In our experience in Omaha, when we introduced this um, and when we really started to proliferate the, the message, what we were getting back from our madrina early on was family saying, oh yeah, no, I, I've seen it, but that's you don't mean it for me because I, as the parent, I'm not college educated. You you mean those that invitation is for the really wealthy Hispanics in Omaha or the college educated Hispanics. And what it took was that picture, you know, myself and a bunch of others going down into the community, introducing ourselves to the businesses, the restaurant owners, the workers, and and specifically saying, I mean you. I'm I'm here to tell you as the superintendent or the head of school that this invitation is for you and your children. And once that relationship got there, you know, we didn't have to continually do that because once word got out that, no, no, this invitation is for all of you and you establish those personal relationships, it's, it's wildfire at it that is. Point in time. It is. I'll, I'll, end, I'll, um, I'll, I'll end with this, Patrick. Um, I, just to bring home how important and how valuable a Catholic education is to, to uh, immigrant families. Um, you know, we, my goddaughter um, lived in the projects in East LA and there was a Catholic school there that, that was able to get everybody that could, that, that they wanted to get a Catholic education. And they had their, you know, their, their mass, their graduating mass, and they would give the mic. I'd never seen this. They'd give the mic to every parent that wanted to talk, you know, and, every parent, they would get the mic and they couldn't finish two sentences without bawling oh, because yeah. they were so proud that their child graduated from eighth grade from a Catholic school. When my daughter graduates in eighth grade in five years, she's going to maybe get a cookie. I don't know, a, a balloon. Like it's not like it's, it, she's right. going to graduate from eighth grade. She's going to graduate from a high school. Like we just know that. But to see these parents bawling, not one could get two sentences the, the word was proud, orgullosa, like proud, proud, yeah. proud, proud, proud. Um, that's the kind of gift you're giving um, these families. I had grandmothers, grandmothers invite me into their home after eighth grade graduation, and they were too nervous to sit with me while they cooked me dinner and hugged me and wept for the, I mean, think about that, you know? We've got a, a generation that takes things for granted and wants to know what else we can do for them. And then we have people that, share our faith, our belief system, and um, who truly embrace what it is we want everybody to embrace. Very true. So let me, uh, we're, at, we're at an hour, so I do wanna wrap things up. I'm just gonna make a couple comments and talk about next steps. For, for all those with a business hat on that ask about you know, financing, the, some of the financial aid that comes along with this, I'm happy to have conversations with you offline. We had four different initiatives in, in the Archdiocese of Omaha of how to broach some of the increase in financial aid that came with it. But you know what, what I get 
you know, a little frustrated with is administrators who don't even want to look at this opportunity because they have this preconceived bias that, you know, oh, they just, they're, they're going to need 90% financial aid. So it's not even worth looking at. That couldn't be farther from the truth. So I'm happy to share some of those strategies to raise some additional money. I'd also say one of the big things that helped us, if you're not aware of what the Hispanic achievement gap is on the SAT and ACT in your community, find out because it's, it's going to be shocking. And then go find out what the Catholic Hispanic SAT or ACT averages and leveraging that with families because a lot of we found a lot of families thought the public schools were just outstanding but they didn't realize the achievement gap portion and so when you kind of highlight the success of Catholic school Hispanic graduates versus public school that became a big component as well. Uh, Manny, LEI, you guys do still allow administrators to come in summer sessions I presume? Oh yeah every yeah. every summer except for last summer and we're still waiting on the final okay from the um, from the university, but yeah, every summer we have what you saw here was just a like you know a small snippet of what we do. Um, we work with you know the administrators, but we also have like teachers come and and counselors, and we really take you from you know from A to Z. And Joe Jones is one of our our mentor principals, so it's not just a conference. We also have you know uh, set you up with a mentor principal. You have a, a team that you'll work with that are all in the same boat as you uh, trying to get more Latino uh, families in your schools and how to serve them um, better. So it's a year long uh, program. So yeah. And, I, and I'd recommend that as well. I must have sent about 20 plus principals in the Archdiocese of Omaha to it. I mentored uh, principals in your diocese, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know what, it's another, it's another learning group. It's another, you know, professional learning community in it. And it, much of what you learn applies across the board, just better ways of behaving with people and, and uh, mentoring people into your community and your culture. Yep. yep, good. Ben, can you take a capture of the chat? I do see a few questions in there that we'll look to get answers to, to the folks that are asking and or address next time through. Um, and again, just because we're at that hour mark, I know Manny had a few other slides, which we won't pull up right now, but he had some other reflection questions for you all to consider on the local level. What we will do is we'll put out Manny's slide deck if he's okay with that, mm -hmm. um, along with the link to this recording. But I'll probably do that after next week's session. Again, next Wednesday, same time, same link, uh, the focus being on the cultural side to all this. As Manny had mentioned, it's one thing to get them into the building, uh, but we need to make sure we're culturally responsive uh, to those new families uh, in order to retain them. And that's a whole nother set of efforts. So Manny, Joe, thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for jumping on the call today and we'll hope to see uh, many of you back next Wednesday. So have a good day. Have Thanks a blessed afternoon. Thank you. Bye.